Hi, just quickly checking. Bruce, can you hear me? Yes, yes. All right. So I'm going to give it uh, a minute uh, for the attendees to join in and they start logging in. Sure. Okay. I'm having, I did free shipping for my dog food and they're just showing up. So if they, if they ring the doorbell, I have to run down and pick up my dog food, <laughs> but hopefully they'll just leave it at the door. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to session number two on day two of the Digital Innovation Summit. In this session, we have uh, Heather Hinton with us. And uh, so uh, it's absolutely an honor and, uh, to have Heather joining us. Heather is a, a, a veteran in the field, uh, not just in IT, but as well as um, in cybersecurity, uh, in all this security area, right? And so Heather currently serves as the Chief Information Security Officer at Ring Central, which is a publicly traded uh, provider of global enterprise cloud communications, uh, collaboration video meetings, and contact center solutions company. And before that, and Heather was an IBMer. Uh, she was uh, at IBM, uh, serving a number of leadership roles. And uh, the uh, the job that she left uh, before joining uh, Ring Central uh, was the Chief Information Security Officer at IBM Cloud. And she was also IBM. Uh, Vice President, IBM Distinguished uh, Engineer, and she's also uh, bear the title of Master Inno uh, Inventor, Master Inventor, right? So for those of you who don't know what it means that IBM is a Master Inventor, that means that she holds over 100 patents, and uh, so she ha has patents, uh, patents uh, covering um, federated identity management, cloud security, and policy management. And for those of you that if you have um, uh, worked for a company that uh, have multiple systems, multiple accounts, and they tell you that, hey, we got this fancy thing called SSO and single sign-on, right? And uh, so Heather is one of the authors and uh, for the single sign-on functionalities as well. So. Um, so a lot of experience and a lot of expertise uh, in this area. So we're definitely honored to have uh, Heather uh, joining us today. Hi, hello, uh, Heather. Uh, welcome to the show and welcome back. Thank you. Yes, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of the participants. Thank you, everybody, for joining from all the various parts of the world that, uh, that we have here. Um, and really excited to be here. I, I know that, uh, Bruce, when you first said, talk about the evolution of cybersecurity, I kind of thought, well, gosh, is, is, is an hour going to be enough? Because I think between the two of us, we could probably come up with a week's worth of war stories. But um, then when I was thinking about it, you know, I thought, uh, I thought back to when I was first starting in this field, and then it wasn't called cybersecurity, it was called security. And the very first textbook that I got was actually on safety systems. Um, and the, the big thing that we spend a lot of time studying were things like the um, radiation machines that you use, for example, for cancer therapy. And I've gone and forgotten the name of them. But um, there was one of them that kind of went out of control, dosed people, dosed a couple of people with far, far too much radiation and, and killed them. And that was what everybody used to start when you were starting into this field was uh, the safety angle of security. And then I had this really interesting kind of, um, it, took, it took this long for the penny to drop, but in yet another one of those, we've gone full circle. That is a variation on, a, on an industrial control system. And look at the amount of attention that industrial control systems are getting today, you know, con the Colonial Pipeline, um, all of the uh, power, power grid systems that we see, medical devices are still a big deal. Um, and so I thought, you know, that when we ended up talking about this, 
we were going to end up drawing, uh, coming full circle on almost all of the topics that we ended up talking about. And so, you know, I wanted to just, you know, Bruce, give me the most um, blindingly obvious and you're kidding me, full circle that you can think of that you've observed in security over the evolution of security. Well, for me, it's uh, actually um, life <laughs> in security begins uh, at uh, the time that when we start learning, uh, hey, someone actually put a virus <laughs> on your computer, right? And uh, so uh, at the time, I was actually working for IBM. And uh, so, I, in fact, I was actually a part of that uh, team that actually initially took IBM's um, antivirus um, research uh, was done at Yorktown High, right? And at IBM Research. And so it was not a commercial product, it was the IBM researchers, and they were researching uh, virus and computer virus and then trying to come up with a solution to fight those virus, right? As we said that, you know, virus, antivirus is a, a good mathematician fighting uh, bad mathematicians, right? And uh, so and sometimes the bad yep. mathematicians are ahead of them and then sometimes that we're trying to catch up. And uh, so at the time that we um, actually took the research uh, work that Yorktown High uh, have done at IBM Research, and then we package it. And I remember we actually, um, this is like a homegrown kind of thing at IBM, and uh, we package it and put it on a, a little diskette, right? If you remember those three and a half inches diskette, <laughs> and then we print a label on it, we sell it as a services to our customers. And so that's where life starts for me in, uh, in uh, the evolution of cybersecurity. So, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I remember when, when antivirus was coming up and everybody was saying, let's go look at the body. Let's go look at medical systems. The body knows how to fight off intruders. Why don't we do the same thing? Why can't we figure out what to do? And, um, I, you know, I remember being in conferences with people who came into security from the biomedical background and then people who came in from the IT background and, and almost things flying across the room as the biomedical, you know, the, bi the biology and medical people were saying, no, 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 we, you know, we know how to make antibodies. We know how to deal with these viruses that go through your body. Um, and then the, the tech people will say, yeah, but then those antiviruses, they go nuts and then they kill you. And and it, it was hilarious because you would have these medical people talking about IT and these IT people talking about medical. And it took, um, you know, a good six months of debate for people to really get comfortable with this mixing of disciplines, which is now everywhere in cybersecurity, right? You, when, you, when you look at what we're doing with AI, that is such a mix of disciplines in terms of, you know, we've got philosophy, cognitive science, neuroscience, we've got uh, statistics, and then we've got all of the programming that we're doing, the testing, the training, um, you know, in, in terms of an evolutionary thing, again, you know, I, I wanna get back to, I think that just as they say that history repeats itself, we see this over and over again in cybersecurity. The other area that was huge when I was first starting out um, it was the impact of aggregation of data in databases. And this was another one where people would be fighting in the hallways over it's, you know, this data, you know, you can't actually aggregate anything. It would take ridiculous amounts of computing power to put all these fields together and get additional information and you're not going to learn stuff. And, and then you would have other people saying, no, 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 if I've got these five databases and they all aggregate. And now it's pretty much accepted. The whole G general data prote uh, protection regulation, GDPR, in, hinges on how the aggregation of individual attributes can uh, now provide information about a person's, a person's identity. And so the, the full circle there for me was that, you know, this data aggregation was really big. We had a lot of people looking at it, but it was just on databases and we had no concept that this was going to be related to people. And now, um, 
you can't think about all of this information without thinking about what happens when we aggregate it. What happens if this person has this information and this person has information and they get together? What can I learn? What happens to privacy? What happens when I'm putting all of this stuff out on social media and social media now gets together with your advertising agency? So again, there's there's this full circle happening on the data side of the house. Um, you know, and, and again, I'm sure you see this, Bruce, all the time, because this has also become mm -hmm. a huge industry, a huge issue within the educational uh, uh, vertical, right? The whole what can we do with people's data and, and what happens when we put it all together? Yeah, I think that uh, so somewhere along the way we uh, evolve, right? And uh, from the react mode. So we go back to the early days and we were thinking about cybersecurity and cybersecurity as a profession, cybersecurity uh, as a role that we play in the company uh, that is mostly is react, right? And uh, we're trying to react to uh, when a virus attack and when someone's hacking into our systems. And uh, now that we evolve into how can we proactively to prevent that? And how do we uh, proactively and uh, to fight uh, the uh, bad actors, and uh, that um, uh, doesn't matter that whether it's a, um, a virus attack or whether that is a, a denial of services attack or um, is uh, going to be uh, someone that actually hacking into our databases and uh, data breaches and all those things, right? And uh, so the, the field got more complicated and uh, so it brings along a lot of challenges because we're no longer dealing with the bad... No, it, it, when, when I said that my life of cybersecurity starts in antivirus at the time that you're only concerned about people actually putting some bad things in your system. But now that is actually, well, not just people trying to put bad things in your system and they trying to um, hurt you in a way that, you know, f from huge financial impact and then also from a attack on ethics and privacy uh, as well. Yeah. Um there were a couple of things that you said in there that I thought were um, really interesting. but and, and one of them actually isn't, I think, a full circle, because remember, one of the things was that it used to be a huge, huge philosophical debate on do I just defend or can I uh, and then do I passively defend? Do I actively defend? And then can I go on offense? Right. And And to be clear for people in the commercial industry, such as myself, right, we cannot go on the offense. That's just not something that is acceptable and in most places legal. But the idea that I can now actually sort of actively defend my environment is one that was um, not something that was really thought of back at the beginning. From an evolutionary point of view, we've moved from, we're just going to um, beat it down. And it was very much like a whack-a-mole, you know, that game where all the little things pop up and you have to go, or go around and hit them and knock them all down. We've moved from that to, you know, we still are always playing whack-a-mole, but we're also now allowed to be a little bit more proactive in that there are things that I can do to actively prevent having to get into that whack-a-mole. DDoS is one of them, web application firewalls are one of them. Um, and where that kind of took me when I was thinking about it was one thing that has been constant, well, there's two things, two massive constants that we can never forget that have been there for the entire evolution, right? One is the network, right? It started with telco and then we moved to, you know, the very limited dot edu internet. And now we've got the broad, broad internet, which is hitting everybody and it's on my phone and it's on my, uh, my iPad, it's on my kids' games, you name it. Um, so we've got the network. The network has always been there and that's always been, to be totally honest, the venue of choice for getting in, right? We can talk about the, the social <laughs> hacking later because that's always a ton of fun. But it's always been the network and it's always been the person, right? It's always been somebody who did something stupid, did something malicious, took a shortcut that they shouldn't have taken. Um, and so evolutionary wise, both the bad guys it's, it's like the bad guys have got smarter, but it's not as if the good people have actually got smarter either. We, <laughs> the bad guys are outpacing us for sure in how aggressive they are getting. And as an industry, 
we are struggling, I think, to keep up with how to protect the people who don't want to spend their day thinking about security, right? They want security to be easy. And, and actually, from an evolutionary point of view, from a cyclic point of view, this, was an, this is another thing that um, I'm noticing. When we first started talking about security, you couldn't have a conversation without somebody saying, but it has to be easy to use, right? Ease of use, ease of use, ease of use. It was drummed into you, right? You'd be sleeping and you'd wake up yelling, ease of use. Um, but it seemed to have dropped out of our vocabulary and out of our speech patterns for a long time. And now um, I really feel it's time for it to come back because we, I think we're about to start on a new evolutionary cycle with the whole hybrid work, people recognizing that even though work has been distributed and hybrid for a very long time pre-pandemic, um, people are just waking up now to the implications of it. And um, if we don't get ease of use back into our lexicon, we're not going to succeed with what we have to do from a hybrid or a distributed work point of view. If, if I have to go through extra contortions to you to do my work when I'm at home or somebody decides, you know, uh, OK, so I love this. There was a Wall Street Journal article that yesterday that was it was a lead up into zero trust, which I completely agree with. But they were they were holding up as an um, a, a thing that we have to worry about is employees working in a coffee shop. Well, I don't know about everybody else here on the phone, but I've been working in coffee shops and, you know, the, the outdoor uh, restaurant pub thing for a very, very long time prior to the pandemic. This is nothing new. So raising this now as something that I need to be worried about seems to be a little bit late, but it does highlight the need to make sure that what we're doing is really usable, really easy. Um, and maybe we have to update our speech so that we're not saying ease of use. What we need to say is security works best when nobody knows that it's there, right? And so this is what you know I would really coach people who are new and getting into this field to be paying attention to is make sure that whatever it is that you're building, right, pick. Either it works for your father, right? I always pick my father because I love him, but he's not necessarily the world's most technically savvy. Make sure it works for your father. Don't pick your kids. They're better at this than we are. Make it your grandmother, make it your mother, but make, pick somebody that you know that is not technically savvy and make sure that whatever it is that you're building, you can explain to them and they can easily use. Um, you know, And I'm sure you've seen the whole ease of use thing, Bruce, just working with students right <laughs> you know what, what what have you what have you seen evolutionary wise from an ease of use point of view yeah so um i i i think the technologies uh that um you know i think i think that there's, there's two different categories of technologies uh that uh, help us to prevent a uh, cyber security attack and uh, to mitigate cyber security risk and one of them is, I guess, is the, on the server side, right? And on the network side, on server side. And then the other one is on the consumer side, and meaning the users, right, from the user side. I think that we did a very good job in, on the uh, user side that we have uh, in making improvements, right? I mean, of course, that there's a lot more improvement can be done. But over the, over the years, I think that we have done much, much better job in improving uh, on the on the user side. I mean, today when you bought a PC, right, as a user, and uh, that you, the cybersecurity software is loaded, and uh, that and uh, and then you turn it on, and uh, it basically um, it does not require any configurations. And uh, that I remember um, probably like what uh, even just a few years ago, right, and uh, go back to ten years ago and seven years ago. And uh, when you're trying to uh, configure uh, the firewall, when you're trying to configure VPN, and that is so difficult, and uh, you pretty much need to know a lot about IT in order to be able to configure VPN server, right? And uh, so, uh, what what do you mean a, a soft VPN, and what does it mean is a hard, uh, you know, or a, CP, a VPN? 
And uh, but I think in that area we're doing a much much better job. And today, so, uh, I mean, everyone is using a VPN, and all you have to do is just load up the, the software and then call that uh, uh, um, that the server uh, with the IP address, and uh, everything is done behind the scene, right? And uh, now I think that on the other hand. Uh, on the server side, I think that um, that's probably where uh, a lot of improvements are still going to uh, uh, need to be there and uh, to facilitate uh, the management uh, of the monitor uh, of uh, potential uh, risk and impact. I'm trying to decide if I want to actually challenge you on that one. I, I, I agree completely that it is much easier for, from a user point of view with your desktops and your laptops. Um, I think that that is the bare minimum though that we needed to have done because when we look at how much time we spend on our devices and the fact that most people, even though they're super easy to use, don't have password managers, right? Or they're storing everything in their browser, cat, you know, their, their browser uh, settings. Um, for their passwords for a bazillion different sites. And they're probably reusing passwords. I mean, I did notice that that there was one, I think it was Google actually the other day, um, gave me the option to do a password check and it was going to look and see, you know, passwords that were being reused and whatnot, um, which I really appreciated, but I also made me a little bit nervous because it means they're probably not properly and individually salting and whatnot, whatever. Um, so when I look at how important devices are to everyday life, I think that what we've done to make security easy with a thing like a VPN, which is for corporate access, right, um, isn't really enough, right? I mean, I, I don't know that it's enough for the home user. I don't know that it's enough for uh, the whole more corporate user with all of the websites that they're going to and the passwords that they're reusing across all of their sites. I think that corporations are starting to wake up to this and really adopting zero trust, which is kind of one of the latest um, buzzwords. Um, but from a philosophical point of view, I completely agree with it, right? Um, the so I think that there's there there are there's still a lot of work we have to do from a usability point of view for individual users. When I go and look at what I would call infrastructure, and I'm not going to include control systems and IoT in my infrastructure, um, I'm still back down, and 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 we have a ton of work to do there too in the industry, but there is still a fundamental belief naive naive faith <laughs> in the network as protecting me, right? I still see risk assessments that are focused on network segmentation with this idea that if I keep my production network separate from my corporate network, separate from all of these other networks, that's good enough. And it's absolutely a start. It's absolutely required. It's a meets min, but all we are doing is perpetuating that crunchy exterior with that nice, soft, chewy, interior. So one of the things that I think we need to do is move zero trust from the user um, to the corporate network and into the actual infrastructure world as well. I don't know that we've really seen, I think that's a new piece. We haven't gone far enough down that path to sort of circle back again in terms of a repeating ourselves. Um, you know, but what have you seen in that space, Bruce? Yeah, I, 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 I actually uh, agree uh, that um, um, that uh, is actually a lot of work uh, and uh, from um, the entire end-to-end <laughs> -end perspective in terms of uh, in terms of the cyber security, right? And uh, that so um, um, I I I I thought the improvement on when you're talking about like password and all those kind of things, and I guess that's why why we have a single sign-on, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, it's it's interesting when we were building out single sign on, um, we we thought that it was going to be well. We were building it really for um, corporate use 
to make it easier for employees within a large company who had to go to different sites to get to HR and payroll and uh, healthcare systems and then you know the 17 other internal things that you had to do. So we were really focused on how it would be used in that kind of a corporate environment. Um, and it was a real surprise, I think really truly, just how it took off for, um, I don't know, I think I'm going to call it internet use for individuals, right? So for me, going to different retail sites, what hasn't really taken off, I mean, it has taken off, but nowhere near to the extent that it needs to, is, are the adoption of things like password managers outside of my browser. And so this is one where I think that there are some very interesting discussions that we can have around which, where have we drawn the line? Is the usability of storing your passwords at your browser um, sufficient that it is going to meet truly the needs of everybody? Or should we somehow be trying to get everybody to have a separate password manager? And at what point do the two now come and merge to each other, right? Neither approach is really going to stop you from credential stuffing using the same password over and over and over again, which it, you know is one thing that leads to all sorts of vulnerabilities when one site's passwords do get compromised. Um, but then there's the, if that's all happening, if I'm going to be misusing the tool, where where do I draw the line? If I'm going to misuse the tool, do I make it really easy or do I actually make it an add-on standalone password manager? And then as a couple of people have said in the chat, right there, we haven't touched on the privacy implications of this at all. But if you're putting all of your passwords into your browser, well, it does mean that the whoever has the browser has to be able to recover your passwords so that they can go and stuff them into wherever do you really want and do you trust them sufficiently with your passwords um you know getting back into the cyclical nature nature of the evolution of cybersecurity, um we seem to have been going in these waves of trust right originally we didn't trust anyone and that's because security grew up really through the military and they had their long they were trying to protect secrets they were trying to protect spies and and whatnot and so they were very very by nature suspicious and that seeped into um, the security space and it really fed people but then we started to and it's not that we didn't lose the trust but it's almost like we got so excited by all of the cool things we could do we could build worms we could build viruses we could build antiviruses we could do all of these really cool things um, and we almost forgot how important it is that trust is a part of what we're doing. And that gets back to what I said earlier, right? The person is so important in here. So how do I, how do I balance between trusting the user and not trusting the user, right? And, and again, love to hear your thoughts on that one. Yes, yeah, so, so on the human side, and uh, that's the most difficult um, uh, piece. Uh, when we when we uh, trying to address problem with technologies, and uh, we know that over time that we're going to have better technologies, and uh, but on the human side and on the trust and as well as um, um, on uh, training people in terms of making the better judgment call uh, when uh, they face some challenges, some situations, and that's the most difficult uh, piece, right? And so um, I have a friend uh, that who uh, is the chief Inf information uh, officer, a CIO, uh, for uh, this huge electronic companies, right? And uh, that they actually have um, uh, office everywhere. And so he was telling me that they have a CFO in Europe and uh, so the the, uh, the CFO at, in Europe and actually receive a call uh, concerning about uh, some financial um, uh, um, informations and uh, that and the call is supposedly from uh, someone internally within the company and uh, the CFO in Europe uh, for that huge electronic company 
uh, actually uh, took the word of uh, whoever calling him. And, uh, and, uh, and it turns out uh, that's what we call social fishing or social engineering, right? And uh, so, so it's not just like the, the, the frontline employees, uh, but you look at someone that a chief financial officer of a huge electronic company still make that mistake. So uh, what can we do? Yep. Uh, is that education is the way to uh, help? <laughs> Well, okay, so let me just tell you, um, I'm going to speak hypothetically here, but I had exactly this happen, or let me rephrase this, I have a good friend who had exactly this happen, which was um, somebody called the CFO, purporting to be the CEO, and actually sounded enough like the CEO that the CFO was kind of going, hang on a second, this isn't really right. Um, and the CFO had a conversation, and at one point started to get a little bit suspicious, strung them along and then hung up and then called me and said, this happened, what do we do? Um, and I will tell you that um, I am actually really grateful to whomever that person was because prior to that, my CFO, <laughs> um, I don't think really in, appreciated just how good and how slick some of these phishing attempts, these social engineering attempts would actually be. And it wasn't until there was personal experience and then a, you know, there but for the grace of God go I uh, scenario that all of a sudden I've got this massive, massive champion. Um, and what, what I think is, yes, absolutely, we have to educate. We have to focus on the people that are targets. Um, I get a monthly report on targets of interests that are being seen for email phishing attacks in my company. And I will go and work with everybody that's kind of being being targeted or has a higher hit rate than others um, and work through, hey, this is what it looks like and simulate it. And once you've actually lived through it, it's so much easier to, um, you don't have to educate, you, you simulate, right? You, you put them through, here's what can happen. You, you role play it. You might not want to pretend that you're role playing. You might actually want to pretend that it's real. But once people have that real world personal experience and connection, it's so much easier. So to all of the CISOs and CIOs and CTOs out there, my advice is, work within what your company will allow and actually try to go after some of your key people so that you can teach them what you what it looks like make sure you work with your legal department please don't ever circumvent legal in this but that's the best way that i have found to educate and then by the way everybody loves it because they can tell stories about it what what is what is more effective is it education or is actually compliance and control policy, right? So um, is, 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 is it the best way to help people uh, to learn is actually through compliance and control policies? Um, okay, I'm, and, and that's a, kind of like a trick question because they're kind of like you can't have one without the other. Um, where where compliance, so, and remember, compliance is just the um, exercise of proving that you are actually adhering to the controls or the rules that have been put in place, right? Um, and rules are always there to be bent or broken, as anybody that has ever raised teenagers with a Friday night curfew knows, right? <laughs> um, but there the education has to be tied to here's what can happen. So what I've really found effective is people love stories. And I think that as technologists who need to be able to speak to business owners, one way that we can do that, one way that, you know, card carrying member of the geek club one way that we geeks can learn to speak business is to tell very short succinct stories 
uh, you know, morality plays if we were in the Middle Ages. And those stories um, need to center around what's the worst that can happen. They need to be close enough to the people that we're talking to that they can easily put themselves in the shoes of that, uh, you know, my CFO is sitting there thinking, wow, what if I had in fact um, transferred money to this other account? You know, what would have happened? And so, but because it was a close escape, right? Because nothing bad did happen, but something bad could have happened. This is turned into a teaching moment slash story where people can now go and say, oh man, you should have seen what happened to me, right? But I was the hero because nothing bad happened because I recognized it in time. So the education has to end up in a, I was the hero story. I averted disaster, something bad didn't happen because of what I did. And I did that because at some level, I remembered what I was supposed to do. I remembered the policies. I remembered the controls that were in place. So, you know, they, they go together. Um, controls without education are useless in education. Well, look, everybody fails, you know, a course or, or a question on an exam at some point. So education isn't going to be enough either. Um, you know, but again, uh, storytelling is uh, a really big part, I think, of how we need to communicate that's how i that's why i talk to people who are not security people about security because that's what they want they want those stories that they can tell at the dinner table to their friends about whatever um you know uh, look at the <laughs> anyways yeah so keep keep tell me tell me about yeah, so some tell me your favorite security story well, actually, I I uh, have a personal experience, uh, some uh, problems just recently. Uh, that uh, so um, it, it's just not long ago. It's about uh, probably about a month ago, and I received uh, a, a payment, right, and an invoice, a bill, actually from Facebook, and uh, actually a payment notice, and uh, that uh, that means that they have done my money already. And so uh, pay like a couple thousand dollars. And uh, so I said, what happened? What happened here? And uh, is that someone uh, got into the account and actually created an ad, right? You can, you can place an ad in Facebook. And, uh, that, and, and then they actually have Facebook collecting money for them. And uh, for that ad uh, that, you know, they, they can increase the, uh, the amount that you play per click and so forth. So pretty quickly uh, that it rings up to 2000, right? Because I, I clicked for $500, something like that. And uh, so I, I saw on the internet, some people like get a bill like for $40,000, right? And uh, so now, now we talk about the friendliness and use, uh, user friendliness uh, in terms of uh, uh, protecting yourself and cybersecurity and so forth. And, but in that situation as a user, um, you, you become very helpless, right? And uh, so especially in this situation, there's not a phone number that you can call Facebook and say, hey, I, I noticed something, uh, right? And, uh, so, uh, and, and, and once they put the, uh, the ad in, uh, because it's, by, it's a daily uh, uh, charge, so that you cannot you cannot turn it off uh, because it's still during the day, right? It's, it's against uh, the Facebook's uh, rule, and so in in that scenario and uh, fortunately and uh, that um, where my uh, uh, credit card accounts uh, 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 comes in and uh, help and uh, to uh, basically uh, protect that and shut that down, right? And uh, so. Um, yeah, so so you hear story like this and over and over again, right? And uh, that um, um, I, I it, now in that situation, and I don't think that um, uh, a um, a uh, education uh, or uh, uh, something can help, right? And uh, so now you probably can trace it back. Say, like, why did that happen? Is it how can someone break into that account? In this particular case, and I found out that because my account was given um, someone else's administrative uh, capability, and uh, I guess because of someone else's uh, break into someone else's account that who has the administrative capability to my page and uh, that kind of things, right? And uh, so, um, any advice uh, in that area? 
Right. And so I'm sure you told that story many times now. <laughs> and so, you know, how have you changed your behavior as a result of that story and, uh, and that experience? And what would you like people to take away from that to help them get better with their sort of personal cybersecurity? Yeah, so I think, I think that when we talk about compliance and control and we talk about policies and we always think in terms of a corporate environment, a business environment. And uh, so after the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, that, uh, that changed because we have all the employees now working at home, working remotely, using their own devices, right? Okay. And uh, so, um, so the compliance and control is no longer just a managing asset that we have in the company and just not managing the uh, security exposures that we have in the company. But now it's uh, tied to your personal account, personal uh, device, personal asset, right? And uh, so I think that we need to extend the policy and need to extend that compliance uh, control uh, mindset. And uh, so um, uh, what should you do, what sh you should not do, and uh, that kind of things, I, even uh, if you are on a personal uh, device, and, uh, but you're using it for connecting to the corporation's uh, asset. Yeah, and you know, just as a note, um, I do not allow uh, personally owned, bring your own devices into our network unless I have complete management of them and the owner has to know that I can seize the device at any time if I need to in order to do forensics or investigations or whatnot. I think that this is a very, very interesting area that we are going to have to pay attention to because much as it's great for me to say all of the devices are owned you know, we own all of the devices that come on our network and we control them and we have um, the, the, the checklist of things that have to be in place before we let them on the network. There will always be somebody that can't afford to do that or that was forced to allow people to have a, a, a bring your own device or, or a personal use device. For them, what we have to do as an industry is figure out how to make it really easy and affordable, right? I need to be able to make it super, super affordable for the SMBs, for the, the mom and pop shops, you know, all of those people, the 100 employees and less, to um, make sure that the systems that their employees are using, that, that are their employees' devices, are being managed to the minimum standard required to do your job, but still allow those people the flexibility to do whatever it is they need to do, right? Watch cat videos all night if that's what they want to do. Um, and by the same token, I have to figure out how to um, draw that balance where um, you know, there is no expectation of privacy on a, our corporate managed devices. We do say limited personal use, but now that I am, you know, the way that we work is changing, I have to relax that, right? I have to say, okay, yes, you want to watch cat videos, go ahead and watch cat videos. Just don't let it interfere with your work, but I need to make sure that it's still protected there. So, you know, from an industry point of view, we've got uh, some, some kind of meeting in the middle that will have to happen. And what we need to do then as part of that is make sure that that translates to the people that are just using their devices for whatever. And that means, you know, I don't get me wrong, right? I, I curse and go and have a drink every time I have to go and do that forced restart of my laptop because it was Patch Tuesday. But we need people, we need those Patch Tuesdays to be less intrusive on our laptops. We need people to be better in a position to cope with them. Maybe it's not a forced restart. Maybe it's all downloads in the background and then, you know, we'll actually work whether my laptop is closed or not. We need to make sure that we are providing the same level of basic controls to all users and desktops. Because again, as we said at the beginning, those users and, and, and the networks that they're on do tend to be the 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 weakest links in, in all of this. Um, Absolutely. And so yeah. I guess what we want to do now is that um, we maybe that we can invite our audience uh, to join in 
uh, maybe that we can uh, start facilitating the Q and A, and then uh, we will uh, uh, look at uh, the questions submitted to the Q and A. For those of you out there, if you still have questions, and uh, you can continue to submit it to the Q and A. And I'm going to invite our colleague uh, Crystal to join us and uh, to facilitate that uh, Q and A here. Yeah. Hey, and Crystal, are we allowed to get um, the the attendees to, to come and ask? Because Eugene Barlas is asking a question, and I'm not sure that I really understand it. So I'd love it if he could come in and, and explain it a little bit more rather than type it in. Sure thing. Let me see if I need to unmute him. Um, okay, Eugene, it I'm says, going to talk if you're okay with that. Hey, Eugene, Hi, Eugene. You're asking Okay. Hi, how's it going? <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I wasn't, I, I was very happy you can't turn on my video. Um, <laughs> it's a pajama day, is it? No, no I'm dressed formally, but um, my background is a mess of stuff. Um, so I, I asked a question about Amazon Sidewalk. And just for people on the call, Amazon Sidewalk is allowing your personal device that you are walking around with or might be in your house or might be in, you know, on a table to share your internet connection with another device of someone you don't know, of someone for whom all you know could be a hacker. You really don't know. And because of, and not a lot of people know this, but when you get a device delivered, um, right now the manufacturer basically makes it as open as possible and unrestricted <laughs> as possible. Um, and Heather started talking about, you know, that she gets control of every device that walks in her office, uh, her, in her company's offices. And it's a major problem. Um, I work a lot with professional athletes and retired athletes. And, you know, they're walking into, you know, Yankee Stadium. And they've got these devices. They've said, sure, I'll be part of Amazon Sidewalk. And all the hard work of the guy who runs IT for the Yankees goes out the window in a split second. Um, yeah. So have you're very, you're much more knowledgeable in this space than I am. I do distribution strategy for the group that serves the Major League Baseball and the NFL, but I am not technical cybersecurity, um, and I have suffered from identity theft. So I am, I am that nutcase who every car since 2002 has a second GPS device in it that tracks everywhere you go, and I am that nutcase that pays a mechanic to remove it every time I buy a car. So. <laughs> Amazon sidewalk. Okay, so and I sorry, it said Apple Watch, and I think so. You had a, a, a an autocorrect. So sidewalk, I think, goes into effect today. I've got to tell you that is in my mind pretty clearly in the corporate evil uh, department. We have not yet figured out what our policy is going to be, um, but I really am going to be strongly encouraging my employees to turn it off just from a from their own personal protection point of view um you know and then the other thing is not letting uh, yeah I, I honestly eugene we haven't really thought about it um it's a it's a tough one because control is taken out of my hands um the piece that will help me at least is that the corporate devices that we have are managed. And so I have a level of control over those and I don't allow you onto the network if there's anything I see on your device that I don't like. I don't know if you can do that in Major League Baseball because my guess is that you want Wi-Fi so that people can you know, check the scores or whatever during the game. Um, I would suggest that you have a completely separate guest network and then an internal trusted network and the guest network, just flush it after every game. Um, know that it's going to be a hot mess, pardon my language, and um, treat it that way. Uh, and then I think everybody, and, and I'm going to call for social activism here, right? I, I really don't, I, I see why a lot of people can think that sidewalk was good, but as a security person, I just don't see an upside to it. And I personally believe that we all need to be going out there and strongly, strongly advocating against sidewalk. Not, not until there are a whole heck of a lot of controls that are transparent, open to investigation, have been independently vetted and reviewed, 
but but that's you know that's my take on it I, I you know I'm sure that there are others out there that have also thought about it Bruce Crystal like so you guys were both nodding <laughs> thank you yeah thanks for the question Eugene awesome um thank you Eugene and thank you Bruce for answering that um we had another question come in um and it's a little bit long in length so I'm just going to read the whole thing it okay. says what are your concerns, if any, with the ease of connectivity that will come with 5G? Is every connected device a potential medium for getting into a network? And if so, what are some of the things we can do at home for our connected devices to avoid the potential exposure um, with intrusion through even the simplest devices like a smart light bulb or smart, smart vacuum cleaners? Okay, um, I'm I'm a fan of dumb devices. I'm going to start there, right? Seriously, the, the and and I know it's hard, right? I I had to get a new fridge, and finding one that didn't have all of that stuff in it was actually really really hard. But the the simplest thing that you can do is avoid those things if you possibly can. Um, from I, I'm not an expert on 5G. I I do have concerns about 5G and about the the just the ubiquity of the radio networks um, we need to uh, I, I think the way that we're going to get better is getting on the bandwagon of things like right to repair because right to repair I think is how we will get inroads into being able to um, turn off things in devices change certificates do but put, put in the basic best practices and then um, you know, we need to make sure that, that our internal networks are as secure as they can make it. And then as we see how 5G evolves, um, we'll just have to continue to evolve and, and hope that we can figure out how to stay one step ahead. Bruce, I don't know if you've got thoughts on that. Avoid them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is the simplest and I know it sounds facetious, um, but, you know, it, it is the only foolproof way. Right, that's, um, that's great advice. Um, right now we don't have any other questions, so I'm here to welcome anybody who is still here, if they have any other questions, or if Bruce, if you have any questions that you would want to bounce off with other. No, I think that, uh, uh, that that was a great conversation and great dialogue. And uh, you know, thanks for some of the questions. And uh, that uh, so, by the way, uh, that um, I'm actually uh, talking to uh, this the Chief Information Security Officer of NFL. Uh, that uh, so we we'll probably be inviting him uh, to uh, speak uh, in the future. So uh, watch this space here, right? And so um, I just want to uh, go back to Heather and uh, for the final uh, thought here that uh, we have gone from um, the early days of cybersecurity and uh, when cybersecurity was not called cybersecurity and, we have, and then we have virus, antivirus, and then you know, we now get to a situation that uh, ransomware is a, a huge thing. And uh, what will we see in the future? Any thoughts? <laughs> You know, every time I try to predict, I come up uh, uh, wrong. Um, I'm really curious to see what happens with AI, how we use, well, first of all, when do we actually make the leap from machine learning to AI, right? I mean, most of it right now really is just hardcore machine learning. Um, I'm really curious to see how and when AI, um, first of all, we can train without bias right? Um, and, and that's all sorts of bias, not, you know, there's people bias, there's technology bias, you know, you name it. Um, but I am really curious to see when it actually becomes the case that I can use AI to become like an intelligence, intelligent um, antivirus immune gene within my system. I, I would love to see that, that, that would be pretty awesome. It will be AI for the bad guys as well, right? So AI for the bad guys. And they're AI probably the ahead guys. of us. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. Um, absolutely, so, for sure. <laughs> yes. Well, wonderful, uh, uh, Heather, and uh, as always, and thank you so much and uh, for uh, the conversations, and uh, thank you for the expertise you bring to our session here. Um, that uh, so uh, this concludes our session here. 
uh, that we have one more session that's coming up today uh, that is at 3 o'clock uh, this afternoon. And at 3 o'clock, and uh, we will have a session uh, on 3 o'clock Eastern time, that is. We will have a session on uh, model risk, right? Model risk is actually a very sp uh, a specific term, right? And uh, when it comes to um, uh, monetary and financials and so forth. And so we're going to have the global head of model risk from American Express uh, to help, um, to be uh, talking to us uh, in model risk uh, management. So everyone, thank you so much for attending this session. Uh, we will see you at 3 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Crystal, for all your help. Have a great day, thank everybody. Thank you very much.